It is Palm Sunday in Jerusalem, in the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. The Coptic Orthodox Church is solemnly celebrating the feast with the other Orthodox churches. Following the long-established liturgical tradition in the Holy City, they turn three times around the Edicula of the Resurrection, waving palm tree branches and ornamented flags, singing songs of praise and loudly expressing their joy. Dr. Anba Abraham, Archbishop of Jerusalem and the Near East for the Coptic Orthodox Patriarchate of Jerusalem and the Near East, leads the procession. Palm Sunday is one of the seven most important feasts of the Coptic Church, together with the Annunciation, Christmas, celebrated on January the 7th, the Epiphany or Baptism of Christ, Easter, the greatest of all feasts, Ascension and Pentecost, the birthday of the Christian Church. At the end of the Eucharistic liturgy, a general funeral service is held in anticipation of the need since the regular funeral prayers for those passing away during Holy Week are suspended for this period. The Coptic Church's tradition is concentrated solely on the Passion, Crucifixion and Resurrection of Christ during the marvelous events of Holy Week. As one of the so-called Oriental Orthodox Churches, the Coptic Orthodox Church is the part of the Church of Alexandria in Egypt which broke from the Byzantine churches in the wake of the Fourth Ecumenical Council in Chalcedon in 451. The Church of Alexandria played an essential role for Christendom, especially during the first five centuries. The use of a fish to symbolize Christianity originated in Egypt with Saint Clement at the end of the second century. Also, the Nicene Creed, the common heritage of all the churches, was authored by Saint Athanasius, the patriarch of the Church of Alexandria from 327 AD. The Coptic leader bears the title of Pope, meaning the father of fathers. Currently, the Coptic Pope of Alexandria, Pentapolis and Ethiopia is His Holiness Shenouda III. The Coptic Orthodox Church presently cares for about 18 million Christians, of which about 15 million are in Egypt and 3 million abroad in the diaspora, besides being the mother church of both the Ethiopian and Eritrean Orthodox Tewahedo churches, which together count about 40 million worshippers. In 1959, however, the Coptic Pope granted independence to the Ethiopian church and in the 1990s to the Eritrean church. More than 95% of the Christians of Egypt are Coptic Orthodox. Our church is today all over the world. We have churches in Africa, United States, Europe, Australia and Asia. Everywhere we teach our faith in Jesus Christ and the Christian life of love and pardon. The Coptic Church regards itself as having never believed in monophysitism, the way it was portrayed in the Council of Chalcedon, as believing in one nature of Jesus Christ, but rather as having always believed in miaphysitism, which is to say they believe that the Lord is perfect in his divinity and that he is perfect in his humanity, but his divinity and his humanity were united and did not separate for a moment or the twinkling of an eye. They were united without mingling, without confusion and without alteration in one nature called the nature of the incarnate word, as articulated by Saint Cyril of Alexandria. Since the 1980s, this definition was agreed upon by theologians from the Catholic, Oriental, Orthodox and Chalcedonian Orthodox churches in their official statements on Christology they also concluded that many of the differences between the churches are caused by the different groups using different terminology to describe the same thing. Egypt was the place of refuge for the Holy Family during their flight from Judea at the time of King Herod the Great and they stayed there until his death. There have been Christians in Egypt since the first years of Christianity 
such as Theophilus, an Alexandrian Jew whom the Apostle Luke addresses at the beginning of his Gospel. The Egyptian church is said to have been founded in Alexandria by the Apostle and Evangelist St. Mark, about 12 years after the Lord's ascension. Christianity quickly spread. The scriptures were translated into the local Coptic language in the second century. The founder of our church is St. Mark, who came to Egypt and evangelized us, but we consider the foundation of the Coptic Church, with its liturgy and organization, as a church, to be from the 3rd century. And to be more precise, we start our year the 11th of September. In the Holy Land, the Coptic Church has about 1,000 members. It dates its present back to the first years of Christianity. The Copts were there at Pentecost because many people used to come at this date and Egypt is not far. At that time, circulation was easy. This was the habit. This habit continued all along the years and there were always Copts coming as pilgrims. Our presence is very important. We are a part of the Near East, though we are a small minority in this country. Actually, our community is small because of the political situation between Israel and Egypt. The Copts are not permitted to come as pilgrims to the Holy Land because the Patriarch, His Holiness Shenouda, gave a decree which does not permit Copts to come to the Holy Land. The Coptic Church has four monasteries in the Holy Land, in Jerusalem, Nazareth, Jericho and Jaffa. All are dedicated to St. Anthony. In addition, there is a convent for female religious members dedicated to St. George in Jerusalem. The convent of St. Anthony in Jerusalem is located at the side of the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre and dates back to the year 325 AD, which was the first year of the construction of the Basilica. Built on several floors, it contains three churches, the main one dedicated to St. Anthony, with a traditional iconostasis, which is the partition that separates the sanctuary from the nave. Then there is the chapel of St. Helena and the smaller chapel of St. Bishop. Several times during the week, the Mass is celebrated in one of these three churches, whereas the Sunday Mass is held at the chapel of the head of the Holy Sepulchre and usually celebrated by the Coptic Archbishop. Deep in its foundations, the convent of St. Anthony hides one of the most extraordinary and impressive sites in the Holy City, the cistern of St. Helena, from which water was drawn to build the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. Coptic families usually like to live close to each other, where they have a strong sense of community, like in Nazareth, where the so-called Coptic street is found. The Coptic Church in the Holy Land is actively involved in sustaining her community, not only with spiritual, but also with social activities. The term Copts is equivalent to the word Egyptians. It's derived from the ancient Egyptian Hakata, i.e. the house of the spirit Ta, a deity of the ancient Egyptian mythology. The Copts claim to be the successors of the ancient pharaonic culture. The Copts came immediately after the pharaohs, so they took the pharaonic language, which was used at that time, and adapted the Christian faith to it. This language was used for a time, but then was nearly lost as a vernacular language. It was preserved by the Coptic Church, not only for use in the liturgy, but also in the monasteries, where they use it as a vernacular language, so as to preserve this rich heritage with its literature. This language is also used in the scripture studies in universities and is preserved preciously in museums. Today, there is a move to introduce it to schools, especially in Europe, so as to preserve it 
from disappearing entirely. The music, as well, has an ancient origin. Our music and hymns are an adaptation of pharaonic chants that were used in certain circumstances, such as burials and other ceremonies. This music is profound and preserves the traditions of the church and the pharaonic culture. The pharaonic culture was very religious, so they had hymns, which were very profound, that they used during their ceremonies and sacrifices they offered to their gods. People find that these melodies are beautiful and relaxing and make us feel happy. We are very proud of these hymns and we like them a lot. Ancient Egyptian culture also strongly influenced Coptic art and iconography, such as the pharaonic Egyptian Ankh key, a symbol for eternal life, which was integrated into the Coptic cross iconography. As one of the major centers of cultural and intellectual life in the ancient world, Hellenistic Alexandria nourished the development of the new Christian faith. Its catechetical school, said to have been founded by St. Mark himself, with St. Justin as first dean, was certainly well established by 190 AD, when it became an important institution of religious learning, with scholars such as Athenagoras, Clement of Alexandria, Didymus and Origen, often considered as the father of theology, until the 6th century, when the famous Alexandrian library and museum were burnt. The school gave a decisive impulse to integrating the heritage of ancient philosophy into Christian thought and to fight early Christian heresies. The Church of Alexandria also gave a great inspiration to the development of monasticism. The persecutions that broke out in the 3rd century created a movement of exile to the desert, developed and organized by St. Anthony the Great. By the end of the 4th century, there were hundreds of monasteries and thousands of cells and caves scattered throughout the Egyptian hills. Over 18 of these monasteries and convents are still flourishing. Egyptian monasticism was instrumental in the formation of the Coptic Church's character of submission and humility, as well as providing the basic elements for her liturgy. The Coptic Church also sent missionaries to Northern Europe, such as St. Maurice. There is a town named after him in the Swiss Alps, with a monastery containing his relics. Copts suffered under the rule of the Eastern Roman Empire of Byzantium, which, after the Council of Chalcedon, considered the Egyptian population as heretics. When the Arab conquest of Egypt took place in AD 641, the Christians were allowed to practice their religion under the restrictions of Islamic Sharia law and conditional upon payment of a tax. In the first millennium, Egypt remained a predominantly Christian land and continued to use the Coptic language. However, by the end of the 12th century, Egypt had changed into a predominantly Muslim country, with Copts suffering persecutions and serious interferences in their freedom of worship, as well as specific disabilities. Their position improved early in the 19th century. The 1919 revolution in Egypt showed the homogeneity of modern Egyptian society. However, in recent years, Copts play little part in the governing of the country. Sadly, since 2005, Christians have been persecuted in various parts of Egypt. Recent events have provided the occasion for all Christians in Jerusalem to demonstrate their solidarity with the Copts by walking together in a candlelight procession from the gates of the Holy City to the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. Egyptians suffer a lot. We pray for Egypt and for peace. Nobody is happy about this situation. People are fleeing the country. Nobody is happy. 
We pray, and the church prays. We fast, and pray, and hope that the calm will come back. And we will be able to live in peace. Peace and calm and have freedom. People are not happy. Nobody is happy. People suffer. We pray and hope that one day we can live in peace and freedom again. People would like to have more peace and love. We pray for peace. These events reinforce the faith of Christians instead of weakening it. Maybe some Christians will emigrate, but at the end, they will come back with a reinforced faith and with an increased love for their homeland. Many of these events have happened in the course of the centuries, but Christians are still here. They will happen again and again, but we will remain, because we have received a promise from Christ. Jesus has said that we would suffer, but also that he would defeat the world and that he would be always with us. He will never abandon us. We are his little flock. How could he let us alone? One of the main characteristics of the Coptic Church is joy, even in her ascetic life. Although she is known for bearing the cross and is always in the midst of sufferings, she is eager to have her children live in spiritual gladness. The Church's liturgy aims at presenting heavenly and evangelical belief to the living and at revealing the Holy Trinity and their redeeming work. By means of her hymns and her rites, this aim is achieved in a way that is simple enough to be experienced by children and deep enough to quench the thirst of theologians. The Coptic liturgy is close to the liturgy of the early church, being inspired by the Jerusalem rites and also influenced by the Greek rite of Alexandria. It developed its own characteristics after the 4th century under the influence of the Egyptian desert monasteries. A typical Coptic service includes five parts, the preparation prayer or early morning prayer, the offering, the preaching mass with readings from the Holy Bible and also a sermon, the reconciliation prayer, the believer's mass with the celebration of the Eucharist and the Holy Communion. Various canons are used for the mass. The most important ones are the canon of St. Basil, the most used, and of St. Cyril and St. Gregorius, which are longer and used for the feasts. The Coptic Church has seven sacraments, seven main Coptic feasts, seven minor feasts, as well as the daily feast of the saints. There are seven feasts for St. Mary, the Theotokos, the Mother of God. Important and popular saints include St. Makarios, St. Mina, St. Barbara, St. Abba Teklachimanot, and St. George. The Feast of St. George is celebrated in Jerusalem on November the 16th with great pomp. For this occasion, the monks from the monastery of St. Anthony visit the female convent of St. George, as does the Armenian community when celebrating the same saint on another date. They venerate St. George's relics by in a touching and complex ceremony that recalls the art of embalming in ancient Egypt. The saint's relics are covered with spices kept in small sandbags. The spices that have remained with the relics throughout the previous year are handed out to the believers for their devotion. Coptic liturgies touch the believers' daily life and also their family life. There is no separation between common worship and actual life. Also, the Coptic Church has kept the spirit of the earliest Christian centuries. The Coptic Church does not let the spirit of the world take over. 
Until now, it has the same spirit as the first Christians, and it is ready for martyrdom, as it has been in the third century, and has its martyrs. And one can feel the devotion, the spirit of sacrifice. Its faith is great and powerful, and our proof is martyrdom for our attachment to Jesus Christ and His Church. Of that, we have to be witnesses in all the world. Even the Coptic calendar, inspired from the ancient Pharaonic calendar with 13 months and three seasons, is grounded upon the Coptic martyrs. In fact, Coptic years are counted from 284 AD, the year Diocletian became Roman Emperor. His reign was marked by tortures and mass executions of Christians, especially in Egypt. Hence, the Coptic year is identified by the abbreviation AM for Anno Martyrum, or Year of the Martyrs. The Coptic Church is one of the founding members of the World Council of Churches and is also a member of the All-African Council of Churches and the Middle East Council of Churches. Since the 1980s, great efforts have been made by its theologians to resolve the differences with other churches. In the summer of 2001, the Coptic Orthodox and Greek Orthodox Patriarchates of Alexandria agreed to mutually recognize baptisms performed in each other's churches, making rebaptisms unnecessary, and to recognize each other's sacrament of marriage. The day-to-day -day relations of the Coptic Orthodox Church with the other churches are generally very good, especially in Jerusalem. We love the other churches, and they love us, and they always think of us and help us in different circumstances, in the happy occasions as well as in the difficult times, also at feasts and joyous occasions. Our relations are good. They send us their congratulations and wishes. I would say that this is really the Christian spirit. Our relations with the Catholic Church is very good. I mean with His Holiness Pope Benedict, the Pope in Rome. We have also good relations with the Orthodox bishops all over the world, and especially in the Holy Land. We have also good relations with the evangelists. In a word, with all the Christian communities. In the Holy Land, there is an organized week of prayer for the unity of the Church. We always participate in these prayers. Our relations are always very friendly and we participate in the meetings and prayers that we prepare the best we can. In the Holy City, the original birthplace of the whole Christian family, the Coptic Orthodox Church insists on the testimony that Christianity should be giving, precisely in and from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the mother of all churches, the Mother Church. There must be more Christians in Jerusalem and more cooperation among them, love and understanding. We know that all the lights are on Jerusalem, so we hope that the good relations among our churches continue to grow and be a model to the churches in the world. We have to have more understanding among ourselves and greater love. I think that our leaders should have better understanding among them and put more effort to work together and love one another and cooperate in all domains. We should give the good example to the others, especially that we are in the Holy Land, the land that Jesus has blessed particularly by His birth, life, death and resurrection. It is enough that we would be one. This is what Jesus has taught us, and I hope that we would be one one day. At a certain time, and because of certain circumstances, geographic, different situations, we were divided in different churches. But I hope that this would be for the glory of Jesus, and I am sure that our leaders are trying and working in the whole world, and especially in Jerusalem, to be one and be one in Christ, and follow what Jesus had taught us. He taught us love, and God is love. Thank you.